Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander, and welcome to The Great War. India had been the so-called jewel in the crown of the British Empire since the 18th century. But the years following the Great War saw British rule shaken, and the Indian movement for independence gained new strength. In this episode, we'll take a look at the dramatic events in India following the First World War, and the emergence of one of the most influential world leaders in modern history. And it all happened 100 years ago. In the years leading up to the Great War, British rule was firmly established in its South Asian Empire, which included today's India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Power was exercised by the British Viceroy, who was in charge of the colonial government of India. Lord Curzon, who was Viceroy from 1899 to 1905, summed up just how important India was to British prestige. As long as we rule India, we are the greatest power in the world. If we lose it, we shall drop straight away to a third-rate power. The war, however, would place great strains on this relationship. The British drew heavily on Indian manpower and resources to fight the war. Around 2 million Indians were mobilized, and India contributed about 50 billion pounds in today's money to the war effort. Initially, British politicians were pleased by the Indian reaction to the war. There were mass displays of loyalty in 1914, and even the nationalists supported the cause. But things had changed by 1917. The campaign in Mesopotamia had gone badly, the British were recruiting men using coercive methods, and they'd introduced unpopular wartime restrictions, all of which increased pre-existing Indian opposition to British rule. By August, new Secretary of State Edwin Montague was promising reforms for Indian governance, but not full independence. The policy of His Majesty's government is that of the increasing association of Indians in every branch of the administration and the gradual development of self-governing institutions with a view to the progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the British Empire. So with the war dragging on into 1918 and no end in sight, the British were willing to make compromises for more involvement of Indians in the government. But Indian nationalists hoping for home rule would be disappointed. Indian nationalist groups like the Indian National Congress and Muslim Khilafat Conference wanted the Montague reforms to be the first step on the road to self-governance. British policymakers, on the other hand, interpreted things differently. For them, India was so important that it had to remain under imperial control. Lionel Curtis, a British official who helped draft the reforms, reflected this view. India's affairs are those of the whole Commonwealth. She can never therefore control them apart. It would not be possible, so long as they remain part of the British Commonwealth, to place the Indian frontier under the control of a government responsible only to the people of India. Instead, the Montague Chelmsford reforms that were passed in December 1919 offered responsibility but little authority. The Act introduced a system of diarchy, which would see Indian staffed councils introduced into some government ministries. However, this applied only to the ministries considered less important to British priorities, like agriculture, education, and public health. The British-controlled government of India kept total control of foreign affairs, security, and finance. In the end, the reforms actually had the effect of reinforcing the colonial system. The British offer of limited power also created divisions amongst Indian intellectuals, and some have considered this a case of divide and rule. Some wanted to accept the minor improvements that the British had put on the table, while others, including Mohandas Gandhi, decided to boycott the councils entirely. Gandhi had been to law school in London, and first entered the political scene in British South Africa, where he campaigned for the rights of Indian workers who were living there. In 1915, he returned to his native India, bringing with him a new philosophy of resistance and the honorific title Mahatma, which means one with a great soul. 
Like many educated Indians, Gandhi had originally supported the war effort and the idea of British justice. But he was disappointed by the reforms and began to campaign for change. Central to his approach was a doctrine of non-violent civil disobedience, which he called satyagrehe, or holding on to truth. By accepting punishment, even physical punishment, Gandhi and his followers hoped to create moral and ethical superiority over the power of the state, which would eventually erode the British will to govern. His approach differed from that of some other Indian nationalist leaders who were often westernized intellectuals, and who were sometimes called brown sahibs by their critics. Gandhi openly rejected his westernized past by adopting traditional dress and connecting political ideas to spiritual concepts that could appeal to both Muslims and Hindus. His behavior and his appearance helped him to win support among the poor of the countryside and students. Historian Dennis Judd explained it this way. Owing mainly to the simplicity and quasi-religious qualities associated with Satyagrehe, Indian resistance to British rule could become, for the first time, a mass movement, not the preserve of a Western-educated elite wearing suits, waistcoats and ties, and making speeches in English to audiences who could not always understand them. Not all of Gandhi's colleagues supported his approach. Some felt that his rejection of Western methods in education was too aggressive and even hypocritical. Independence activist Lala Lajpat Rai, for example, questioned the logic of making spiritual or ethical arguments to the British. Rai felt reasoning with the British was akin to, quote, placing pearls before swine. So the Great War had given new strength to Indian independence groups, but the reforms the British had introduced had failed to satisfy them. Part of the reason for this was a mutual suspicion between the British and the local population that owed much to the bloody events going back to spring 1919. In 1919, Satyagrehe was just one of many ideologies that the British were worried about. There was the rise of Bolshevism in Russia, Kemalism in the former Ottoman Empire, and the Republican insurgency in Ireland. The British were afraid that these ideas might weaken their hold on India, and there were indeed some signs that this was happening. Indian communist leader M. N. Roy looked to Bolshevik Russia for support, and the British perceived the restoration of the Caliphate in Istanbul as a test of loyalty for Indian Muslims. So in March 1919, British authorities in India introduced the Anarchical and Revolutionary Crimes Act, also known as the Rowlett Act. The act gave the state new powers to deal with alleged seditious activity, including detention without trial, suspension of the right to gather or protest, and control of the media. To many Indians, this was an unwarranted continuation of the hated wartime restrictions, and it essentially made the activities of Indian nationalists illegal. Activist Srinivas Sastri protested to the Imperial Legislative Council. When government undertakes a repressive policy, the innocent are not safe. Men like me would not be considered innocent. The innocent, then, is he who forswears politics, who takes no part in the public movement of the times, who retires into his house, mumbles his prayers, pays his taxes, and salams all the government officials all round. Gandhi agreed and called the Rowlett Act a, quote, piece of devilish legislation, and he encouraged Indians to resist it. One peaceful protest occurred on April 6th in the northern city of Amritsar in Punjab region. The British authorities arrested and deported the local protest leaders, which further inflamed tensions. On April 10th, protesters clashed with police. The crowd threw stones, and police responded by opening fire, killing 12 and wounding 30 others. Protesters then reacted by looting shops and by beating five Europeans to death. Brigadier General Reginald Dyer was sent to Amritsar to deal with the growing crisis and put a stop to the violence. But by the time he arrived, the protests had already taken on a form of peaceful disobedience against the restrictions on gatherings. 
On April 13th, about 10,000 locals had gathered in a walled enclosure known as Jallianwala Bagh to listen to speeches and to celebrate a local religious festival. Around 5 p.m., Dyer arrived with Gurkha and Sikh troops and several armored cars. The vehicles were too large to get into the compound, so Dyer advanced on foot with about 90 men. Within 30 seconds of arriving, Dyer gave the soldiers the order to open fire without having given a warning. In about 10 minutes, 1,650 rounds were fired, which killed at least 379 people and wounded about 1,200 more, although some estimates of the dead put the figure much higher. The Amritsar massacre was a turning point for the Indian independence movement. For many Indians, including Gandhi, the attack and ensuing debate removed any doubt in their minds about the true nature of British rule. General Dyer felt that his actions had been a necessary and justifiable use of force. He called the political gathering, which had been illegal, a quote, declaration of war and said that his actions were meant to send a wider message to all of Punjab. The responsibility was very great. If I fired, I must fire with good effect. A small amount of firing would be a criminal act of folly. I had the choice of carrying out a very distasteful and horrible duty, or of neglecting to do my duty of suppressing disorder, or of becoming responsible for all future bloodshed. I fired and continued to fire until the crowd dispersed, and I consider this the least amount of firing which would produce the necessary moral and widespread effect it was my duty to produce, if I was to justify my action. He also said that he had acted to save face. I think it quite possible that I could have dispersed the crowd without firing, but they would have come back again and laughed, and I would have made what I consider a fool of myself. The massacre caused heated debate in Britain. Liberal Party politicians, including Winston Churchill, considered it an excessive use of force and described Dyer as having gone rogue. On the other hand, many conservative politicians, newspapers, military figures, and Anglo-Indians supported him and said that he acted either out of self-defense or out of a sense of imperial duty. One newspaper even raised £23,000 for Dyer from private donations. The official British response to the incident did little to ease tensions. The October 1919 Hunter Report concluded Dyer had exercised a, quote, mistaken conception of his duty. The report found that Dyer was at fault, but not the British Indian government. It also found that there was no Bolshevik plot behind the protests in Punjab, and it recommended that Dyer be retired and that new policies be found to reduce the use of force. The House of Commons approved the report's findings, but the more conservative House of Lords rejected it. Dyer eventually retired early, but faced no other punishment. Gandhi was disappointed in the report, but not because Dyer had been let off easy. Instead, he was upset that the role of the Anglo-Indian government had all but been ignored. We do not want to punish Dyer. We have no desire for revenge. We want to change the system that produced Dyer. Recently, historians have argued that the massacre was not an extreme reaction to a tense wartime situation, but rather a part of a continuation of a long-time colonial policy in India. The British had long used collective punishments, and often communal guilt was assigned to the Indian population when conflicts arose. Indians were often framed as naughty schoolboys who needed to be punished for their own good, and Dyer even suggested that the Indians should be thankful to him for the lesson in respect that he had taught them. There are historians who have defended Dyer, mostly using similar arguments to those that were used at the time, that he was acting in self-defense or that he used no more force than was necessary. 
In general, in the historical debates, Dyer tends to be portrayed as either an arrogant butcher or as a soldier in a tense wartime situation who had a terrible duty to carry out. 100 years later, the debate in Britain is still ongoing. The Amritsar massacre stirred passions at the time, as it still does today. And in 1921, its impact was no less dramatic. When the Indian councils started their work in January of that year, they found little support from the people or from the government. The council's effectiveness was limited by the massacre's effect on public opinion, Gandhi's opposition to them, and the British resistance to meaningful reform. Without public support, the councils couldn't exert much pressure on the government, and in any case, the British still controlled the all-important finances. And the reformer Montague had now fallen from grace, and his former colleagues were looking to cut ties. Montague himself realized that his reforms were failing, as he admitted in a letter to the Viceroy in July 1921. The Prime Minister has, as you know, little or no faith in me. Meanwhile, Gandhi's support was on the rise. Students boycotted schools, lawyers boycotted courts, and villagers burned foreign cloth. Potential British civil servants now stayed away from India, and fresh university graduates from England no longer saw the Indian civil service as a path to an easy life and a lucrative career. In December 1920, the Indian National Congress held a series of conferences in Nagpur to determine the movement's future. They officially adopted Gandhi's non-cooperation strategy as part of a campaign called Swaraj in one year. Swaraj meaning self-rule. Gandhi hoped to achieve self-rule in 1921 by rejecting monolithic central state structures, promoting a stateless society, and uniting Hindus and Muslims. But in 1921, the non-violent self-rule project seemed to actually be weakening as the year went on. Violence broke out between Muslim Khilafat members and Hindu landlords in August, which increased tensions within the independence movement. In November, the Prince of Wales arrived in India for an official visit, and despite Gandhi's call for peaceful non-cooperation, there were outbreaks of violence. Within the British administration, there were growing calls for Gandhi's arrest throughout 1921. Privately, he worried that his movement might actually provoke more violence than it prevented, which was the opposite of its intentions. What was clear by the fall of 1921 was that Indians hoping for self-rule would have to wait. And now that we've talked about the troubles in India in 1921, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about the troubles on YouTube in 2021 for history creators like us. That's why we crowdfunded and released our Battle of Berlin documentary, 16 Days in Berlin, specifically outside of YouTube, where 250 of our videos were retroactively demonetized because they changed their rules years after these videos were made. And given this kind of climate, we've taken further steps to be safe in the future. We teamed up with some other creator friends to have a platform where we don't have to worry about YouTube's capricious actions. This platform is called Nebula. On Nebula, you can watch top educational creators like us ad-free and support them at the same time. For example, this video you're watching now doesn't have this very ad on Nebula. And we can publish content there, which we can't put on YouTube. Like our documentary series, 16 Days in Berlin, we want to thank Mark Newton for his help with this episode. And as usual, all the sources we use for the episode can be found in the video description. And if you want to support our channel, you can do so on Patreon, and the link for that is in the video description as well. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is The Great War 1921 a production of real-time history, and the only YouTube history channel that follows a doctrine of non-violent civil disobedience.